morning. How's everyone today? Uh, I'm Angela Strickland. I'm the Special Events Director for Bell & Graf Gardens at Home. Uh, I greatly appreciate y'all all being here today. Um, today, we, um, I'll do a little couple of things first, I guess. Um, we still have one more Winter Wednesday next week. That'll be with uh, Dr. Thomas Stein. It'll be cool and crazy plants of Bell & Graf. So I think that one's going to be a really fun. Hopefully the weather will um, work out for us and maybe we'll actually get to go outside and see some of the cool and crazy plants. Um, you know, all depends on our awesome weather we have that changes from day to day. Could be 90 next week, you never know. Um, also, we're getting ready. We do have our um, new event that we have come up Saturday, March 6th, Bell and Graf Ears and Blooms. Um, it's a very short two and a half weeks away. So, um, limited number of tickets. We'll have beer vendors. Um, we'll have shopping vendors. We'll have food trucks. It'll be all from noon to 6 p.m. Uh, social distance, of course, from the Great Lawn. So, plenty of space out there to spread out and have fun outside. So, if anybody has any questions, please let me know. Um, so, excited about that. We also do have a hot lunch today. Um, it's roast beef, roasted potatoes. Uh, orange glazed carrots and a roll. And I went back in the kitchen earlier and it smells fantastic. So please stay for lunch. Um, but today we have Mr. Martin Vandergeesen. Uh, Mr. Martin Vandergeesen has served as the 2007 president of the South Alabama Nursery Association. He has been the president of the Mobile Botanical Gardens from 2011, 12, and 17. In 2013, he was the president of Alabama Nursery and Landscape Association. 2015, he was the president of the International Plant Propagators Southern Region. He has served several terms on the board of Azalea Society of America, from whom he received Distinguished Service Award in 2010. Martin is the president of Vander Geesen Nursery, a 52-acre wholesale nursery that he started with his father, Peter in 1990. Uh, Martin is married to his wife Colleen, and of course, they are avid gardeners. <laughs> would you would you expect anything less? Um, thank y'all so much for being here, and thank you, Mr. Martin Vanderkissen. Thank you. I can't believe you guys came out on this awful day. I mean, if I ever saw a day that was Ash Wednesday, this would be it. I'm going to get a real quick show of hands. Who cares if I take this stupid mask off? Right. I, I'm getting along with you guys well already. Okay, this uh, we're going to talk about azaleas here. And this lecture was originally prepared for undergraduate students at uh, Auburn. And I thought, well, I can water this down a little bit. And I thought... Nah, let's not. Let's go ahead and do this. So I, I put a little bit of fluff in here for it, but uh, the reason for this is because we know so little, really, about azaleas. I mean, if you talk to somebody who is a native freak and you ask them about Lyonia, they can give you two or three different species. If you ask them about native azaleas, they'll rattle off eight of them. If you ask them about evergreen azaleas, which is our number two ornamental in the deep south, they'll go, uh, azalea obtusa, and then that's where they stop. Well, that's silly. And there's so much information out there that is outdated and poor on the internet. If you look, it's either going to be azalea obtusa or it's going to be azalea indicum, and neither one of those things are valid. So let's talk about azaleas a little bit. What we're going to look at are the different types of azaleas, what azaleas can do, which we, believe it or not, don't really understand very well. We're going to talk about new hybrids and some of the, uh, the, the work that, believe it or not, is still being done. There's a lot of uh, hybridizers still in the United States that are doing exciting things. And we're going to talk about not just our decidu deciduous azaleas, but deciduous hybridization, which is really pretty exciting work. A lot of it was uh, done right here in Mobile, Alabama. So we're going to start with what do we know about azaleas? And most folks, they'll tell you that they know about the indicus, right? You know about the Formosa azaleas, the big purple things, and the gerbies and the tamer. We know those guys. 
We also know the dime store is A's, the Kurumi is A's that came in to the, uh, the industry really in the 1940s in a big way, and, and they put them in little cans and they, they grow all over soon. We sold billions of them. Satsukis, we don't know those very well, but uh, those are your Gumpo's A's, and there's a lot hidden there that we're going to talk about. That was the A of the Samurai. It's uh, the one that was cultivated in Japan by the royalty for thousands of years. We're going to talk about the deciduous azaleas, and what we're not going to talk about very much is we're not going to talk about the cold hardy types, uh, a rhododendron, camp ride, yato ants, pumpkin ants, because why should we? We're in Mobile. <laughs> the other thing we're not going to talk much about is rhododendron old hamii. Does anybody know what rhododendron old hamii is? Anybody ever heard of encore azaleas? <laughs> ah, now we're talking. Rhododendron old hamii was what. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Brown and Buddy Lee, uh, Dr. Brown at LSU, and uh, Buddy Lee at in Franklinton, Louisiana, crossed with uh, a whole bunch of other things to come up with a race of azaleas that bloom in the fall. Uh, by the way, that was first done by Baron Rothschild in the uh, late 1800s. So there's my house, and, and yeah, I know I need to cut the grass. And uh, there's a big old Formosa, how many people have planted for most in front of your windows in front of your house? And then our Kurumi azaleas, which we're going to talk about. And then uh, Satsukis. And then we're going to talk about some deciduous hybrids. So, what are azaleas? Well, all azaleas are rhododendrons. All rhododendrons are not azaleas. They are in the genus rhododendron. There are eight main subspecies in there. The first uh, ones we're not going to talk about, Hymanthes, which is your rhododendrons that you think of when you think about rhododendron. Those are the ones in the mountains of Carolina, your Petaviants, and your Minas, and your Rosebows. And then the small leaves, scaly leaves, the Elepidotes that you find. And there are some hybrids of that that will do well in Mobile as well. But we're going to talk about Pentanthera, five anthers. That's our deciduous group. And we're going to talk about Sususi. And that's a scary name, but just think that that's a, uh, a land deal with Susan that went wrong. You had to sue Susan. <laughs> okay, so where are Isaiah's? Where are they from? Where you think, well, my grandmother had them, so they must be from here, right? Well, if you said North America, you would be 100% wrong. So some smart Alex could say, well, they're from Asia. And then I get to say, well, you're 95% wrong. If you look, Right here, that's a shaded area. Just a little bit in the Korea, north of South Korea, a few spots in uh, China, in the woodlands here. And then I'm not telling you this, but a little bit in Laos and Thailand. And that's it. That's where the native, that's where the uh, evergreen azaleas are native to. So it's Japan that we were talking about. Well, what do we know about Japan? Japan's a little bitty island, isn't it? out there someplace off the coast of China. It's uh, mostly palm trees and, and, and um, people drinking drinks out of coconuts. No. But the top of that is subarctic. So that is right uh, down below um, Alaska. And then around or the surrounding that is, is pretty much going to be uh, continental climate. It's cold. And it's Latitude 30 to 45 degrees. These islands extend all the way down to Taiwan and the Ryukyu Islands. So what does that mean for us? Well, their average rainfall is 60 inches. Our average rainfall is 66 inches. And if we look, there's the United States and there's Japan. That little bitty island extends all the way from Canada down to Cancun. So that's maybe not so little bitty. Also, because of the orientation of it, it covers an extreme, and the, the, uh, the main island is from 45 to 30, but the small islands go all the way down to 25, which is definitely tropical. That's down to Cancun. So what do we know about the Incas? We know they have big leaves. We know they're big plants. We know they're fast growing. We know that uh, they made the South famous because they couldn't take them up north. This garden here was a southern Indica garden. 
the Zetia Trail in Mobile was the Southern Indica Trail. This is what the South was known for, was these Indians, typically have single flowers. Well, what does that mean? What is an indica? Well, it's rhododendron indica. No, it's not. Rhododendron indica is a satsuki. So we're going to talk about why that happened a little bit, but we want to look at that, the species because that, that tells you a lot. We got the formosas, the big soft leaf guys. That is rhododendron simsii. That comes from the forests in Laos, Thailand, and China. It's none of the Japanese. Because it's down there in uh, lower China, it's a little bit tender. That's why it can't go up to uh, the, the upper latitudes of Japan. We're going to talk a little bit about Mucronata, which is even more tender. That comes from the Ryukyu Islands, which are way, way down south. And Phoenicia, Gerbing and Tabor. Anybody have Gerbing and Tabor in their yard? Gerbing and Tabor have a, a very long, lanceolate, leathery. Green leaf. They're completely different creatures from the uh, the Simsii, the Simsis. So when you see those now, instead of just going, well, this is Rhododendron obtusum, you can say, okay, I know what this is. This is the one. This is the one that's down from the right Okay, and uh, the 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 Bible for Isaiah's, which is Galley's book called Isaiah's. He, he states that the, uh, the confusion started with uh, John Sims in 1812, who, who published uh, a tome on the Isaiah's color plate, and, and they threw everything into Isaiah Indica. So originally, the confusion with calling everything Indica comes from that. Uh, everybody said Isaiah Indica when it actually covered the entire thing of Sususi. Now, Sususi is 28 different sub subgenera inside there, and we're, we're going to look at some of those. So where are the Ryukyu Islands? Ryukyu Islands run all the way down to Taiwan. That was a big trading center. It was its own kingdom uh, up until about 1500. It was allied with, Japan, with uh, China. The Japanese took it over. But this entire series here has a lot to do with us because in that area, Mobile lies. And we're up at the top of the Biotsumi. But still, we can use a lot of these plants in this area. So, rhododendron simsii, here's more confusion. This comes out of northern Thailand. It's a barium specimen by a uh, botanist. It's completely wrong. That's Venetia. Over on the right, what do we see? That's simsii. That's Formosa, isn't it? Big, broad leaf, purple flowers. That's our boy. But this is how deep the confusion runs on these azaleas that even the botanists are putting out for various specimens that are completely wrong, wrong species. So what do we know about these southern charm? We've all seen that one. Big flowers. You notice something here? Just a little, can't see very well in this picture, but there's just a little flush of uh, purple back behind that blotch. And that's how you tell the difference between Southern Charm and Judge Solomon. Because if you don't have the blotch, you have Judge Solomon. Now, if you're a nurseryman and somebody comes in and you have Southern Charm and ask for Judge Solomon, then there is no difference. <laughs> Daphne Salmon, also known as Lawsall. These are another Simpsi I thought. You see the characteristics that we're talking about with the broader leaves and the, the bigger plants, that's what Simsii does. Here's another problem we got, which is common names. Pride of Mobile. Everybody knows Pride of Mobile. It's also in uh, Charleston, it's called Pride of Somerville. Or you go to England, it's called Elegant Superba. Or you go to Louisiana, it's called Watermelon Pick. There we run into some, some issues. Rhododendron Phoenicia. Phoenicia. Rhododendron pulcum, sweet name, mucronatum var, mucronatum ex indica var, homerosanum, blah, 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 blah. It's a mess, huh? Well, we're going to straighten this mess out. We're just going to call this Phoenicium. Phoenicium is the one that's got the little leathery leaves to it. And so you're gerbing in your table. See, there's our herbarium specimen, and doesn't that look like it? There's your George Tabor, Phoenicium type. 
This is it. Uh, these pictures were taken at Stephen F. Austin University in Nacogdoches, Texas. It's one of the most beautiful azalea gardens I've ever seen. Absolutely stunning work that was put together by Bard Stump and David, Dr. David Creech and, and a few folks. If you ever get a chance, you should go there. This is a sport that we found, uh, which we named after Billy Lucas's daughter, uh, Audrey Marie, sport of George Tabor. Uh, fully variable, just a little, mostly white, but it'll have those, those lovely little purple stripes in there. Sacadera, now we're into our new for native types. Now, this one is easy to tell as well. If you've got big fat leaves, what have you got? Simpsia. If you've got the long, Skinny ones with leathery kind of texture, Denisian. If you got these guys, grab it. It's sticky. Sepals are always sticky on, on this one. That was a, uh, a mechanism that the plant used to keep lace bug off of. They crawl up and they get trapped up in the glands on the, uh, on the sepals. Sacadera comes all the way down from the lower part of the Ryukyu Islands. It's good in Mobile down on the coast, but you have to establish it. It's, uh, Takes a, takes a little bit more work, but it's perfect for us. Here's another macro seed work that, uh, again, is a little bit tender, but isn't that lovely? And it shows you some of the different forms that these things can take. This is Koromo Shikabu. There's also a white form of this. So, again, what are we doing? We're talking about indicus. We know that indicum is not a uh, indica species. There's an interesting story about this as well. Some of the first azaleas that came into Mobile, or came into the United States, were listed as Southern Indicus that were actually Setsuki. So some of the Indicas that are not Indicums are Indicums. How's that for confusing? We're going to forget that. We're going to take those back out of Southern Indica and put them where they belong. So we have the Simsei, our Southern Charm, our Formosa. We have our Mucor native, which is our Fielder's White, our Sekibera, and then we've got our Phoenician, which is our Gerbing, Tabor, Omurasaki, and uh, that group. Remember that the, the Simsi and the Phoenicians are from the woodlands of China, where Mucor native and, and Indica, uh, Indica, come from down in the Rayuku Islands. So let's talk about Kurumis. Kurumis came into the United States from Wilson, it was a plant collector. Uh, for USDA back in, in the 1920s. And he brought them in to the Demoto brothers in California, and they showed them at the World's Fair in 1920. And it was a huge hit. Everybody loved these things. First off, we just looked at Southern Indicus. You could not grow those in most of the northern cities. They would come drive for days to get down here to see our Azalea show. Well, all of a sudden they had azaleas that they could grow themselves. Smaller blooms, bright colors, extreme variability, lovely plants. Good winter hardiness, and they grow in compact and cool climates, and then in open growth habit and warm climates. So what does that mean? That means that this is what this looks like in Washington, D.C. Now, I crawled all around this plant, and there's a label right in front of it, which I didn't see. <laughs> Well, that's what we want. Well, this is what I get from Karumi. Now, why is that? Well, here's why. Karumi is another one of those things that if you look at uh, the internet and try to find out, or you look at the books and you try to find out what is Karumi, what does this actually mean, almost all the botanists in the 1940s, 1950s threw up their hands and said, obtuse them. And threw that name away, and they really didn't know. But it's it's come down to be fairly simple. You have two species, Cusianum and Sateyens, that are mainly responsible for those. Both of those come from Mount Kirishima and in Kyushu Island in Japan. Both of them are, are grown about 2,000 to 5,000 feet. Now, what are we thinking about 2,000 to 5,000 feet? We're thinking about mountains, aren't we? Okay, so... Camphorai, which is the uh, most common azalea, originally that was thought to be a part of it. Uh, and then our friend Obtusum pops up again, and they're saying that maybe that's a, a cross between Camphorai and Cusiana. I say throw Obtusum out the window, and if anybody ever says Obtusum to me, I hang up the phone. <laughs> so here we are. Kumamako, right there, that's where our, uh, our Karumis come from. Now, what did we just talk about? We talked about the latitudes, 
of where we are, we're down here. So what's up here? Chattanooga, Tennessee. So those are native to Chattanooga, Tennessee. So why don't they do well on the Gulf Coast? Well, what about this picture it looks like Mobile, Alabama? <laughs> Now, for years, I looked at the, uh, the Kurumis, and you can grow them by the gajillions in buckets in, uh, in Mobile. And the Sims nurseries, we, we've grown millions and millions of them. Why is that? Because the roots are protected. You get good drainage, perfect drainage. The temperatures are controlled. They don't have our, our bad. They get to cool off at night. So there's just a, a myriad of reasons they do well in containers, but they tend to be tricky when you put them in in, uh, in landscapes. I mean, I will challenge any one of you to show me a 20-year-old Christmas cheer. You see 20-year-old coral bells here and there. Now and then you may see a high note, high note crimson. But they typically, Tommy Dodd put it, I think most succinctly, Tommy Dodd Jr. He said, those plants are like Yankee women. You can bring them south, it won't kill them, but it's going to make them miserable. <laughs> My friend Bobby Green, Green Nursery in Fairhope, really clued me in to uh, what the Kurumis were about. You can grow Kurumi here, but you have to grow Kurumi a little bit differently than what you think of. If you want to turn it into a little mushroom, forget it. It's not going to happen. But if you take this plant and you don't prune it, put it in the back of your, your, uh, your beds, use it as a woodland setting, these plants do absolutely beautiful. He showed me uh, some 20 year old Kurumis in, in uh, his garden, 30 year old Kurumis in his garden, they're just gorgeous. But they're large, open woodland plants. Use them like that, they'll be just fine. They have bright, bright colors, wonderful things. Again, this is Stephen F. Austin University. Uh, this is their Ruby Mize garden. The, uh, the garden is gorgeous, the women there are gorgeous, but they're just a little bit dangerous. <laughs> So let's talk about Satsuki because I think really when we're talking about azaleas and mobile, this is where our conversation needs to go. We don't live on plantations. Most of us don't have 40 acres that we can plant out into gardens. Most of us live in urban or suburban environments where we have plants that we want to stay low, dwarf, that, that will maintain themselves without having to butcher the things that go out every five minutes with a pair of clippers. So here we're talking about the satsuki. Satsuki are typically low growing, although there are some exceptions. Tolerant high rainfall, hardiness, well, who cares? They're fine for us. And late flower. Now that's that's another key. Satsuki actually means fifth moon. These plants, once you think the Azalea show is over in Mobile, Alabama. Please go to Mobile Botanical Gardens. Look at the Azalea collection there because the Satsukis are just now coming into bloom. That means that if we actually understood Azaleas a little bit better, Mobile could be in bloom all the way from March through May just by using the right plants. So we have two things that we need to talk about. Oh, here's our friend Indicum again. Except for now, he's in the right place. Indicum is a satsuki. He comes from southern slopes, steep mountains, average rainfall, 100 inches a year, long, thin foliage typically on these guys. And rhododendron tamarind grows at sea level near Yakushima in the deep south of Japan. Round foliage, narrow foliage on indica, round foliage on tamarind. Tamarind, another name for it is area carpet. So what it used to be called. Occurs in most unfavorable habitats for Azalea. I've been accustomed to finding them in the cool most habitats on the slope of volcanic clones, long granite streams, sphagnum bogs. I was totally unprepared for the unique habitat of tamarind. Tamarind grows, now listen, grows at sea level on the northwest coast, land drops into the ocean by means of sloping walls of granite. The vegetation is subjected to constant sea winds, bright light, Hot, humid climate seems a harsh, uninviting habitat for azaleas. Now, where do we know that has 
constant sea winds, bright light, and a hot, often humid climate. Hmm. Well, bingo. Here we are. This is where Tamarai and Area Carpet come from. And where are we in that map? Well, if you run over that red dot, you're going to run over Mobile. So maybe that's what we need to be looking at. Fortunately, fortunately, this turns out to be the most beautiful azaleas in the world. And it's perfect for Mobile. So why isn't this azalea everywhere? Because it comes from the south of Japan. And most of the United States population centers are on the east coast. It's unsuited to those climates. Most of the plant production that we're doing, and I'm a nurseryman, I grow these things. We sell up along the east coast. So plant production number-wise, these plants have never been really exported because of hardness issues. You see all kinds of variability of these things. You see rain, self, sector, flex, stripes. They'll do just about anything that you can possibly imagine. And they tend to stay low, compact, rounded, what you think of when you think of the kind of perfect shrub that you want in front of your house. Flowers can range anywhere from four and a half, five inches down to nothing. And indicum runs all the way down to the Ryukoidals. We looked at that earlier with the uh, with the Yuka natives. And this is uh, this is the south part of it. They tend to be a little bit, if you're looking for a little narrow foliage, they tend to be a little bit tender. Even for us, they're a little bit tender. But they, we planted, I think it was 350 cultivars of Mobile Botanic Gardens. I lost two in 10 years. Say, guy, here's one of your income types. Again, you see that split petal. And I think that's, that's one of the more, there's another one called steno, stenopetalum, which is a, a big, tall thing that looks like a teenager with a, a safety pin in his nose. Uh, it's a, a little bit of an oddity. This one I think is more attractive. Uh, again, this one has some, some this is rhododendron indicum. This was one of those that has uh, naming issues. This is what Ivoriana looks like if you're east of the Mississippi. If you go to the west coast, the same plant is purple. Deciduous azaleas. Okay, so where does deciduous azaleas come from? Now here, if you said Asia, you would be 95% wrong. If you said Alabama, you'd be about 90% right. So what are our species? And, and forgive me here, these things jump around because I'm not good with technical stuff. Albamensi, which we find all over the Black Belt in Alabama. Cumberland Densi, which we find up around DeSoto, uh, up in the north part of Alabama. We've got Australian, which you can find, that's our Florida plain. It's over on the Escatawba River. We've got Calendulaceum. Now we don't have Calendulaceum here, but we got something even cooler. We got Calendulaceum's daddy. Uh, just, you know, we think we know about plants because, well, we've been here for 200 years. Folks, that's nothing. There have been two new species of, of deciduous azalea that have been described in the last five years. One of them was in the Black Belt of Alabama, Rhododendron colbanii. For years and years, they called this thing uh, some form of albumensi, but it didn't grow like albumensi. It didn't grow where albumensi grew. Well, it turned out they did the genetics on it. <clears throat> when the last glaciation period came down, pushed all the plants down, and then it receded. This was what happened to Cumberland, no, to uh, Cumberland, uh, to uh, uh, Calendulaceum. Calendulaceum, this is related to. So we don't have that, but we do have uh, Colmania. Canessens, our Piedmont azalea, all over the uh, Mobile Delta. Uh, that's the pink that you see in the woods all over the place here. That's that's uh, Rhododendron canessens. And then Rhododendron flamium, no, we don't have the coming azalea here. You can't have everything. Paracliminoides, the awful name is Aya. <clears throat> Originally, it was uh, new to flora. Uh, somebody decided to, to destroy the name and give, give us that. That's Pinkster Bloom. Pinkster Bloom is the, uh, the pink azalea that grows up again around uh, the top of Alabama. You see that in mixed hard ones. Prunifolia, Prunifolia, Alabama. It's on the Alabama, Georgia 
border on Chattahoochee. It's the rarest of the deciduous azaleas. And then Viscosum, our swamp azalea, if you find that probably in the woods around here. It, it runs all the way down to the coast. They're all over Dog River. Arborescence, uh, most highly fragrant is, uh, deciduous azalea there is. It's white with red stamens. And if you go up to DeSoto in the spring and uh, walk around the falls, oh, y'all turn your phones off. You know, somebody wants to sell me some car insurance. Your warranty is expired. Yes, my warranty is expired. <laughs> and I can't pay for my student loans. Uh, Atlanticum, uh, it's a good hybridization partner, but we don't have that here. And then we're, we're going to look at a few of them. These last ones here, Ludium, Volus, and Japonica, and Oxygen Tally. Ludium comes from the Balkans. It's the only European deciduous society there is. It's a beautiful yellow, and it was, uh, it was instrumental in developing a lot of the, the hybrids, the early hybrids. We'll talk about them a little bit. Mollus and Japonica are the two Asian species. Large, large flowers. And again, they were used in the hybridization here. And then Oxygen Tally, the West Coast is a, will live here about five minutes, if you're lucky. But it was a very important piece of, of uh, the hybrids that we're going to talk about. So there's your canessins and your flaniums and your austrinums. So we're going to talk about modern hybridization because things did not stop in the 1920s. There is a whole nation of Isaiah geeks that like nothing better than going out and, and dabbing pollen on things and have for the last 50, 60 years. And they've created a body of, I think, very important work that needs more recognition than it's gotten. We're going to look at some of those folks. One of those is Dr. Eugene Aromi. Dr. Eugene Aromi was from Mobile, Alabama. He was an education professor, professor at the University of South Alabama. Had a uh, little suburban place over there by Langham Park, uh, about a half an acre. In that half an acre, he did over... 100,000 seedlings. He did 1,004 crosses and created an incredible race of azaleas. Early on, he was working with uh, the evergreen azaleas, but he's really known for his deciduous azaleas later on. But what he was trying to do here was to bring down the height of our southern indica azaleas to match the scale of our current gardens and to put more diversity rather than the single flower forms to put more diversity into the flower forms. And they succeeded marvelously. The, the aromi azaleas tend to be about two to three feet. They actually look like southern indicas, grow like southern indicas, but the flowers are completely different. He threw this program away. He took these around to the nurseries and sims. They were awash in azaleas at that time. And a little bit of history lesson. Part of what happened to uh, Azaleas, we used to have a lot of diversity in azaleas in Mobile. But as the nursery industry became more mechanized, and as it, it became more organized, we were trying to do more and more with less and less people. What does that mean? That means diversity is your enemy. You want to do as many numbers with as few plants as you can. The potting machine did more damage to the diversity of plants than any single uh, machine I've ever seen simply because it allowed us to do thousands and thousands of plants with very few people. So when Aromi took these around in the nurseries and sims, he said, that's nice, we've got too many azaleas already. So he dumped the whole program. Fortunately, a friend of his, Dr. Giordana, saved the program and we discovered, rediscovered the program decades later at uh, Dr. Uh, Giordana's farm and resurrected these and, and started interjecting them in back into the industry. Wouldn't it be a shame to lose these plants? Wouldn't be a shame for those to go away. Buddy Lee, uh, who did the Encore Azaleas, he also did a lot of hybridization with Southern Indicus. This is uh, the Cata Fortunia across with Fisher's Pink. It's one of the prettiest Southern Indians I know. If you've got Fisher Pink in your garden, I recommend you plant one of these with it. It's just a, a wonderful highlight. One of our greatest plantsmen, Kusaku Sawada. Anybody ever heard of Sawada before? Sawada 
is mainly known for his work with camellias, but he was a remarkable plantsman. He did work with magnolias, camellias, and azaleas. Early on, and we're talking about the 1940s, he was looking at, at the uh, azaleas for the same reasons. Let's bring the height on, on these things down, and let's see if we can't get the Caribbeans to where they will live in Mobile. So he did a series of crosses with the Caribbeans, crossed with the, uh, the Southern Indicas. Del Frieda is probably one of the ones he's best known for. But something to say is he had hundreds of crosses and he only named four plants in the, in the uh, Isaiahs. Kurumis. Kurumis also didn't stop. Uh, Dr. Creech, who was, uh, John Creech was a USDA man, brought another series of 100 and something Kurumis into McCrillis Gardens in the 1960s, 1970s where they, they still are. Again, he's bringing a lot of diversity in forms, a lot of uh, variability, and a lot of changes in, in, uh, in uh, flower forms to these things. A lot of this group is planted, uh, well, a representation of this group is planted at Mobile Botanical Gardens. Wakabisu, some of y'all might know Jose as well enough to know that's a Satsuki, that's not the Satsuki. So, what's the problem with Satsukis? Well, what's the problem with Mobile and May? It's hot. It's real hot. It could be definitely hot by May. So, a lot of the hybridization that's gone on in the United States has been directed to try and to bring the Satsuki back a little bit into our climates. And some of the guys that are most successful in doing that or Robert Gartrell with the Robin Hill hybrids, and Colonel Pete Vines with the Holly Springs hybrids. Uh, Colonel Vines is a character. I, uh, I called him up and, and asked him if I could borrow his slides back. Y'all are old enough to remember what slides are, right? I asked him if I could borrow his slides, and, and he said, yeah, you can borrow them, but I keep my 45 clean. <laughs> he got them back. And then James Harris at uh, Lawrenceville, Georgia, did a lot of work with uh, Ben Morrison. B.Y. Morrison was the director of the National Arboretum in the, uh, in the 60s. He retired down the past Christian. Uh, when he passed away, James Harris uh, picked up a lot of those hybrids and started working with them, which again are largely Satsuki based. What Ben Morrison was trying to do at the end of his career when he moved down the past Christian was hybridize for us. The Robin Hills tend to be pastel in color. They tend to be softer colors. They tend to be very, very large flowers on these things. So what do we know about that? It's largely area carpet. It's got the big round leaves. Indicum's gonna have the, uh, the, the narrow leaves. White Moon, this was the favorite of, of the uh, late Margie Jenkins in, in uh, Franklinton, Louisiana, another one of our, our world famous nursery people. This was named after Gartrell's wife, Nancy of Robin Hill. There is a full collection of these at Mobile Botanical Gardens. These bloom before the Satsuki, after the, after the Southern Indicas are done. So when we think the Azalea show is over in Mobile, it's just beginning, just beginning. Now, Colonel Vines, on the other hand, was a different type of personality. He was an Air Force guy and he was rough and tumble and, and his uh, his Isaiahs had a completely different thing. He liked the sharp, strong colors that uh, the Satsukis took and he loved variability. All these flowers off the same plant. He liked the different forms, white peacock, gives you that, that uh, split petal form. That's actually one of the slides that I almost got shot for. <laughs> Astronaut, largest flower I know. Uh, it's about five inches across. Irish cream, he loved green in the blotch, and, and that one uh, has a lot of green in it. Again, these are low growing, compact plants. They're fairly maintenance free. They're perfectly designed for Mobile, Alabama gardens, but they're going to bloom after your southern indicus. Midnight Flares, probably, that's from James Harris. That's James up at the top, and James was definitely a character. I met him in Lawrenceville 
and walked around with him, and he explained to me how he had just crossed the tomato with the county on line of polio. So I smiled nervously and backed up to see if he was armed, and he wasn't. But, uh, whoop, that's on film, isn't it? Hi, James. He's, he's gone now. Uh, this is one of our best-selling uh, azaleas. So we, we put this one into the market, and uh, it really took off. Beautiful, beautiful, deep, deep gray color. Lower compact, and you know, he's holding another one, which is called Pink Cascade, which is a cascading azalea that you can use for baskets. Isn't that lovely? River mist. New deciduous hybrids. <coughs> really, there are, there are two guys that were instrumental for deciduous hybrids, and both of them were from Mobile, Alabama. Both of them were working about the same time. Both of them had the same kind of an idea, and that's Tom Dodd Jr. Uh, and Tom Dodd, his son, Tom Dodd III, his son, Tommy. And uh, they worked with Bob Schwint up in Atlanta. Um, and uh, Tom sent some pollen up to Bob to make a cross. We're going to talk about that. And then after Romy threw away his Evergreen series, he got interested in why the Xberry hybrids and the Gent hybrids and the Nacville hybrids, which are so popular up in the Northeast, would not live here. Well, let's talk about that. Here's why they didn't live here. Here's a short history of, of the Xberry azaleas. Xberry, you can really start in about 1750. The, the uh, um, plants for the Americas were, were a rich man's game. If you had azaleas in your garden, you were doing something in the 1750s. And it really didn't start until Mortier in uh, Ghent, Belgium started in 1825. He crossed sweet azalea, mountains, Swamp azalea, Pixar bloom, mountains, flame azalea, mountains, Pontic azalea from the Balkans to give an azalea hardy enough for them to be able to grow in Belgium. And succeeded. They were absolutely gorgeous. Those were called the Ghent hybrids. And somewhere around 1880, about 50 years later, Coster in Holland and Anthony Waterer in Knapp Hill, England, took those same plants and they added mollus and japonica which may be the same plant big big flowers again bright yellow bright colors big beautiful things they added those to it to give us some variability that's where we got the mollus hybrids then anthony waterer later on went ahead and added oxygen tally to it and bingo that was the key all of a sudden you had variability all over the place these plants would do all sorts of things there were the most beautiful azaleas anywhere in the world except Mobile, Alabama. Why? Because we had taken the western azalea and five azaleas from the mountains, and we had mixed them together, and we had tried to bring them down to the coastal plain, and they don't belong here. So Lionel Rothschild, Baron Rothschild, took one million seedlings and planted them out at his place, and he came up with a gorgeous race of azaleas called the Xperia. And those uh, took America by storm in the 1920s. Well, Mr. Dodd looked at it. That's Mr. Dodd Jr. and his father who founded Tom Dodd Nursery about 1910 uh, in Sims. And that's Mr. Dodd over on the left. He got the idea of let's take this and let's cross this with our Florida plane off the Escatawba River over here. So they took rhododendron ostrinum and they mixed it back in. He took Hotsburyella, which is one of the X berries, remember that's the one from Baron Rothschild, and crossed it with ostrinum. It is the single most fortuitous cross in the world. Out of that, he got incredible variability. Anything from this, this is all the same cross, same seedlings, sister seedlings, to Stonewall Jackson. Robert E. Lee, his son, Tommy Dodd III, named them after Confederate generals, dooming them to obscurity forever, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, these plants are not represented at Mobile Botanical Gardens. Now, if each one of y'all would call Mobile Botanical Gardens to say, look, I'll give you $100 if you put those in the garden, then maybe we could do that. I know just the place. 
And Avril Sims was the bellwether for uh, for deciduous azalea hybrids. For a while, this guy was everywhere in the industry. It roots like a weed. It grows like a weed. It's impossible to kill. This is one of the toughest azaleas that I've seen. It is the, the standard that we use for yells and deciduous. Dr. Eugene Arumbi did the same thing. He brought a bunch of uh, things from Park Seed and brought them down here, and they died. And he's like, why? He started looking into it, did his research. He's an education professor. He, looked, he figured it out. And so he uh, he started planting these things. And this big old bear next standing next to him is Dr. G or John G. or Don, who was a physician at, at Cersei. And he is a uh, was a native his A and free. I mean, he just loved native his A's. He loved plants, very wonderful man, big old bear of a human being. And boy, I got some stories I could tell about him. I'll tell one of them. He he came and got me one day at the nursery and he said, Why don't I want you to come with me? So, okay, we're going to look at some plants. Now, it was a nasty day. So I, I jump in the truck with him. We take off. About an hour later, I'm back where we're going. He starts telling me another story. He tells me another story, another story. Three hours later, I'm like, Doc, where are we going? We ended up on the Arkansas border at Gloucester Arboretum because he wanted to show me the plant. <laughs> He got with the doctor, Eugene Aromi, found out what he was doing, and he said, I'll buy everything you've got. And so he bought all the ADL series. And he was a friend of the still over here, which is John Allen Smith, Magnolia Nursery in Chunchilla. He was probably responsible for more diversity in Mobile, Alabama plant material than any one human being ever. He still had the most beautiful garden I have ever seen in the southeast of the United States. It's still up there. I don't know what kind of shape it's in. Last I heard, somebody bought the property that was a welder because they wanted the barn. Uh, but they, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Smith took those and planted them all over his property, and then he got with his manager down there below, which is uh, uh, David Ellis. David named the first 10 aromies and released them, and they produced them, and they took off. Now, when he retired, when uh, David Ellis went off uh, on another business venture, he got with this young lady right here, which is Linda Guy, uh, Linda Urban at the time. Uh, Linda took the plants to uh, South Carolina with uh, Jay Guy at, at Carolina Nursery, which was one of the largest nurseries in the United States at the time, and they really developed it. But the weak link was that no longer did Aromi have anybody locally that he, he could work with to get these plants going. That's where I stepped into the picture. And I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Aromi for the last five years of his life. And I inherited his stud books and I inherited all the plants that he still had. And it took us another five, 10 years, 10 years, I guess, to really sort through what all we had. This is one of them that he never saw bloom. Tom Johnson at Magnolia Plantation brought a couple of interns down from France and they said, Oh, it's fantastic, and I needed a name, so uh, now it's fantastic. <laughs> Queen's Rose. Very gracious. I'm sorry, I, if I knew how to turn that thing off, I would. Again, there are about right around 100 of these that he named, and he did over 100,000 seedlings on these plants. This is one of my name for Tom Dodd Jr. Uh, again, he never saw this plant bloom. He made me promise that I would not release anything unless it was different from what uh, he had already released and in some ways better. And we have kept that promise. I've been through thousands of plants and we've been very, 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 very few. Southern Sunset, this one's remarkable. Some years it'll be peach pink, some years it'll be bright yellow. It just depends on the weather. Temple's toy was a seedling. His uh, granddaughter, Temple, he had uh, just done a cross and he had a little tag on it. And he looked and Temple was batting it at the, uh, the tag. He's, oh, oh. So he named that one Temple's toy. You see the remarkable diversity that we were able to bring in to these things by adding mollus, adding japonica, adding oxidentality and bringing them down with Australia. Now we've got this incredible race of 
graces of his agus that we can use for our abilities. So again, let's let's review for a second. We've got the endocosagus. Now we know we've got three different types. We've got the formosa type. We've got your verbing and tabor types. And then we've got the bupronatums, which is coromo, shikabu, secadir, and the ones with the sticky sequels. We're not going to call these endocobes anymore. We're not going to call these obtusums anymore. Okay? Promise me. The coromis, we've got the kusiganums and the satayants from the mountains of Kyushu Island. Those are both at about 1,200 to uh, uh, 1,500 feet, and those two kind of melded together, and that's where we're, we're getting our kurumis from. And then we've got our samurai with our round leaf and our, our uh, indicum with our, our pointy leaf and the covers of those things from Yakushima, which, again, right where we are. And then we've got our aromi deciduous and our dog confederate deciduous azaleas, which were born in Mobile, Alabama. Thank you. I appreciate you coming out on such a nasty day. We got some time to kill. I've got all kinds of messages on my phone that I can delay. Judy. Uh, Mobile Botanical Gardens Spring Plant Sale Catalog goes online Friday night. Mobile Spring, uh, Mobile Botanical Gardens Spring uh, Plant Sale Catalog goes on sale Friday. Friday night. Well, okay, Friday night. In March. Will you have some of these represented at the sale? Oh, yeah. I've been putting azaleas in that sale for the last 20 years. So, I mean, most of the azaleas, if you go to Mobile Botanical Gardens plant sales, that you're seeing my azaleas. So, I've been trying to dump diversity into this city for, for 20 years. Anybody else? There is going to be a test. You know, put, put your pencils on, on that desk. And... Yes, dear. How can I a large azalea and a rhododendron. All azaleas are rhododendrons. All rhododendrons are not azaleas. All rhododendrons are not azaleas. Right. Right. So how can you tell the difference? Well, I think what you're asking me is how you can tell the difference between a lepidote rhododendron and an azalea. And it's fairly simple. The rhododendrons are going to have leathery leaves. They're going to have larger foliage. And they're going to die here. <laughs> um, they typically are from mountainous areas, and, and it's amazing. That's another thing that, that we didn't talk about is the sheer number of species. You know, there are 28 different species of azalea, and we're using less than half of those in, in the industry. Uh, old Hamiot made Buddy Lee a very rich man just by finding one new species and introducing it into the trade. So I'm curious what the other ones look like. But to answer your question, the rhododendrons, there are a few of them. Rhododendron minus, Bobby, Bobby Green's been working with some of them that were found in Baldwin County where they were not supposed to be. And he has uh, introduced those, but they have heavier leaves uh, and, and a much heavier texture than you're going to see with your eggs. Well, I was surprised when we, we traveled the length of the Allegheny Mountains from Georgia to Maine, and they are covered. Yes. With, with yes, they are. That's because that's, those are our uh, lepidote and lepidote rhododendrons that grow up there, and they like the mountains, so they don't like the coastal plain. There are, to my knowledge, there's uh, only minus is, is the uh, Catawbians. So you can kind of bring it down here, but most of, of the, uh, the rhododendrons that you see in the Carolinas are not going to survive down. It's, it's an interesting story, though, because Dr. John Thornton in Pushkatap, Louisiana, uh, Franklinton area, did a, a, a huge, huge body of hybridization work with rhododendrons just so that you could grow these down here. And if you look at Mobile Botanical Gardens, there are about five or six huge leathery leaf rhododendrons, and those are all John Thornton's work. They're rare, hard to find. Um, Flowerwood Nursery did a series of those things, and I'm sorry the series escapes my mind right now, but there are a few that have been hybridized, and there, and there will be more in the future. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, so I'm originally from Louisiana, and I have a family that's from Texas, and 
And you're telling me Coal that, miner's daughter. Yeah. Um, so you're telling me that the, the rhododendrons, and sometimes call it Mount Laurel, um, growing in the in the mountains there, I'm not going to be able to get that type of a rhododendron to survive down here? Yes, and no. Yes, and no. The county of Lanifolia, your mountain laurel, actually is, uh, if you can go to the University of South Alabama and you look at the creek that runs back behind it, it has 100-year-old counties that are that are mountain laurels that are growing on site of it. There are mountain laurels that grow here. Uh, now, when you talk about the large leaf rhododendrons, those big, beautiful trusses of flowers, no man. There is some hybridization work that's ongoing right now. The problem that we've got is root rots. It's Phytophthora. Mm -hmm. uh, our grounds stay too wet for those guys. If you think about the mountains, what do you get? Yeah, drainage. Lots of drainage. And down here, it's just a little too little too hot, a little too humid for them, and they tend to get root rots. But if the state flower, and I'm trying to put something out of my, my property here, if you want to, to pick a good state flower, then, then I would go with the, uh, the Australian azalea, which is absolutely gorgeous. It's a big ball of yellow flame, and those are uh, found right here on, on the Escatawba River in Mobile County. Say the, say the type again? Austrinum. A-U-S-T-R-I-N-U-M. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh-oh. I Dr. Remember, was saying. I remember hearing years ago, probably from Jim Barry, uh, when the encores were, not long after the encores were invented on Maine, that the addition of encore azaleas to the azalea market did not expand the azalea market. It only took a bigger slice of an already existing market. So now 10 plus years forward from that conversation, what's the state of the azalea market in the industry right now? Oh, well, that's an excellent question. What, for those of y'all that couldn't hear it, he asked, did the Encores actually expand the azalea market, or what is the state of azaleas in the market right now? Encore azalea, I don't have the statistics for it. I know my personal production of those, uh, we're doing about 40%. Encore Azalea. So they have captured at least that much and probably more of the overall marketing. Um, did they increase the market? I would say yes. I, I would say that they did simply by the virtue of advertising. Azaleas had not been advertised, I don't think, ever since uh, Bellingrad Gardens was founded. I mean, we used to have these huge Azalea shows down here, and those went away. And then the Isaiah Trail we had, it went away. So I think the Encores breathed some life into Isaiah's. I think it also reduced a lot of uh, the, the diversity in Isaiah's. It's not as big of a market as it used to be. Now, I'm hopeful that with the advent of direct mail, of uh, online marketing, um, did anybody here a Japanese maple fan? Did anybody look at Mr. Maple's site? These guys, uh, Mr. Maple sells, he's got a thousand Japanese maples that he sells online. Um, they're getting into his eggs. Uh, they're going to be down here next week. And uh, I think the future is good for his eggs because it's going to skip the middleman in a lot of ways you're not going to see them in the big box stores it's going to be, become more of a specialty item but i don't think azaleas will go away i don't think ever at least i hope not. i hope i go away long before they do <laughs> anybody else yes sir has there ever been thought to redo the azalea trail oh bill finch and i've thought about that for years we tried uh, you know, there has to be political will for that to happen. You've got to get buy-in from the city to make that happen. And, uh, you know, it could be done, and it should be done. Uh, we planted the uh, azaleas on Spring Hill. Y'all seen the azaleas on Spring Hill? That was uh, 
And that was Dan Otto and, and uh, Bill Finch's brainchild uh, and by his eggs. Uh, that was supposed to be step one of the revitalization of the Isaiah Trail. We were going to start there with that corridor down Spring Hill and then work the rest of it, but it, it never really uh, never really happened. <clears throat> See, I'll make it happen. What nursery do you need to supply the deciduous ones in? I should call them count. Uh, and locally, I don't do much. Okay. Most of what I do is get shipped out the state. Uh, Loveville Botanical Gardens, uh, Abler Garden Center. Um, uh, shoot, there's there are several good garden centers here in, in town. And Stokely Garden Express, uh, uh, with their new operation in Midtown, just tell them that you want some aromia azaleas, and you saw them at Vanderbies, and, and I'll, I'll bring it. I live. Three blocks in there. All right, go to the questions. Thanks, folks. Appreciate y'all coming down on this ugly day. Thank you. Thank you.